I would like to just say thank you so much to everyone that has come to be part of this powerful session. We are so privileged to have uh, a powerful team from the School of Nursing. And they've done this before and we always benefit from their wisdom about various things that touch on our, you know, on our well, on our health. And I just want to thank you so much, whether you are here to, um, because your professor told you to attend, I'm sure you are going to gather information and strategies that are going to help you uh, as you maneuver your way this semester, as you think about your health, as you think about your wellness as a student, and so on. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Susan Moya, who is going to be our moderator today to start us off. Thank you so much, Susan and your team. Welcome. Thank you. So it's great to be here. Yes, I'm Dr. Susan Moyer, and I am an assistant professor at the Wareheim School of Nursing here at Millersville University. And I am going to be your moderator today, and I'm happy to be here to discuss our topic on building a resilient mindset by engaging in health behaviors, which helps to really discuss academic resilience from the lens of health promotion, which is a significant aspect of what we do as nurses and in our uh, profession of nursing. So I'm delighted that we have four panelists today, all of which come from our Doctor of Nursing Practice Program or DMP program uh, here at Millersville University. Two of our panelists are graduates of our DMP program and then we also have two panelists that are current students in our program, one of which is preparing to graduate this spring, so that's very exciting. Um, so each of our panelists are advanced practice registered nurses who practice as nurse practitioners in various specialties among various uh, settings in our community. It is also the case that many of our panelists have not only um, either pursued their degree and gotten their uh, graduate degree here with us, um, but have also gotten other uh, degrees in nursing from Millersville University, whether it's their baccalaureate or their master's of science degree in nursing from Millersville. So we have a fantastic panel of speakers today, and I'm just delighted that we're um, back here again for the academic resilience session. So before we get started, I do want to give everyone an opportunity to introduce a little bit more more about themselves. So we'll just go around um, and we'll, if you don't mind, just giving a little bit more about your title or position, where you work, and perhaps maybe your scholarly interests or what you worked on either while in the program or during the program here at Millersville. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Michelle Cronister. Good day, everybody. I'm Dr. Michelle Cronister. I am an assistant professor in the Wareheim School of Nursing. I'm also a full-time nurse practitioner for WellSpan Health. Um, I did get my bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh way back in 1993, but then I did earn my master's degree at Millersville in 2014, and I earned my doctorate in nursing practice in 2020. Uh, that was quite a year. Um, I have always had my focus in maternal health, and my uh, doctoral uh, dissertation was on a balanced breastfeeding, a proactive approach in caring for women and infants. All right, thank you so much. Uh, how about Dr. Kelly Federhoff? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Federhoff. I am a recent Millersville graduate. I graduated in uh, May of 2022. I got my bachelor's of nursing from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Um, and I received that degree, which is my master's um, from Drexel University. I currently work as a psychiatry consult liaison for UPMC. Um, so I do see patients that are in crisis in the emergency department um, and patients medically admitted to the hospital. Um, my DMP project, I created an education for the family nurse practitioner students here at Millersville, um, where I discussed um, substance abuse stigma um, and gave them education how on how to treat patients with substance use disorders in the primary care setting. Wonderful, thank you. All right, Emily. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Sirks. I'm actually a current student of the DNP program and hopefully graduating here in May. Yes. I did receive my bachelor's from Millersville in 2016 then graduated with my master's in 2021. 
Um, I currently work for Penn State Holy Spirit Cardiology as a nurse practitioner. Um, and so my focus of my DNP project is actually heart disease prevention in the fire service, um, as my husband is a firefighter. Great, thank you. And then last but not least, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Troutman. I am a current DNP student um, focusing in on nutrition and how it affects uh, cognition. This is a big passion for me because in a former life, I was a chef uh, turned nurse. I did graduate from Millersville with my BSN back in 2019 and my MSN in 2022. So um, rolled right into my DMP project. Currently, I'm a full-time nurse practitioner with Optum. I work in long-term care with the Derontological Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for giving those introductions. I think that's really important to set the foundation for what you're all going to be talking about. Um, and so just a little bit about our topic before we get into our panel discussion. Uh, so if you've participated in any of these other resilience sessions, um, you may be familiar with the idea that resilience is all about bouncing back uh, from tough situations and building that resilient mindset so that we have the ability to adapt to changes, learn from challenges, and even understand more about the feelings and emotional responses that we have when we're experiencing situations uh, that present with adversity. And so building a resilient mindset really does help us navigate the world and certainly move through the obstacles that we're going to meet in our journey, whether it's in our educational journey or even after graduation when we move into our professional worlds. And so many resiliency models will identify the importance of being and feeling well in order to build and use a strong resilient mindset. And developing resilience and having this strong mindset can help one to develop the strength and that fortitude to overcome challenges and maybe more importantly to help inspire you to continue moving forward despite the adversity. And so today's panel uh, of advanced practice registered nurses are going to be discussing the importance of engaging in healthy behaviors that can contribute to building that resilient mindset. Um, so that you can keep your mind and your body strong. Our panelists each have expertise, as you've heard, in, and interests in the four main behaviors that will be discussed. Uh, we're gonna be talking about sleep, a little bit of diet, a little bit of exercise, and a little bit of stress management. Um, and they will share current recommendations for each of these behaviors, but also personal stories on how they use these behaviors to help them navigate um, them through their challenges and their academic journeys. And then they'll conclude with some strategies to help improve or strengthen one's health promoting behaviors. So just before we get started, just a little bit about our format. We've decided to um, have each panelist kind of speak to each health promoting behavior. And then we'll um, bring it back together and open it up for question and answer or comment period. And we were pretty deliberate um, with the our order of our behaviors, um, really focusing on the idea that if we start with sleep, that may be one of the more important ones because without a good night's sleep, um, it's really hard to engage and participate in, in and tackle what might come the next day. So um, we are going to start with Dr. Michelle Cronister. And uh, Michelle, I'm gonna give it to you and maybe you can share with us how how does sleep build or contribute to resilience? All right, thank you. So I just wanna make sure that you can see my screen. All right, fantastic. So sleep hygiene, um, you know, it's to improve resilience. And we do that by having a good reset and restore. And so I want to make this applicable to all of you, especially you students, knowing that you need to have your multiple electronic devices, um, you have to have your cell phones, especially when you have to do your duo um, uh, acknowledgement to get into your website um, and log into school. And if you start to see that battery depleting, uh, you sort of get into that panic mode. And then often we lose our chargers and we can't find those. But so we see all this importance in that. But, you know, we kind of look at the, the body, the mind and, and our overall health similar. And how are we making sure that we're staying charged and reset. I think often we put so much emphasis on maybe starting our day and how we get ready and, and how we get ready to go out on the weekend and the things we're involved in, but what are we doing to allow our bodies to restore and get ready for a new day? When looking at the National Sleep Foundation, uh, there are recommendations for sleep and 
just looking at this graph, you can see that, you know, our little newborn babies need a lot of sleep. Um, and as we get much older, maybe less. But, you know, I ask you to sort of take a step back and ask yourself, well, how much sleep are you getting um, each night? And what is the quality of that sleep? And probably for most of you that are observing right now, you're probably falling in that seven to nine hour um, time frame. And I'm uh, imagining that most of us are not always getting that. Uh, but poor sleep duration and quality is associated with a wide range of health consequences. Um, specifically diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, depression, and anxiety, um, specifically thinking about those things with, you know, struggling and balancing all the things that you do with school and an overall lower immune system. So what, what's my why? Why did I get excited about sleep hygiene? So back in 2014, as I mentioned, um, when I graduated, uh, with my master's degree. Through those uh, years of going back to school, I was working full time. Uh, I was raising five children. Um, I was in my 40s. I had my fifth child while I was in the program. Um, and I even bought a new house and moved all at the same time. So really big stressors in my life. But I was you know, thinking I could get by on three to five hours of sleep if I could just get all this stuff crammed in my day. Um, and over time, I began to feel really horrible physically and mentally, um, not to mention I began to gain weight. Um, I wasn't carving out time that I needed to be able to participate in healthy activities such as working out, eating well. Um, these things all start to accumulate and impact your overall health, and I was running on empty. So what is sleep hygiene? It's healthy habits, behaviors, and environmental factors that can be adjusted to help you have a good night's sleep. This includes quality of sleep, which is duration. The length of sleep should be sufficient for the sleeper to be rested and alert the following day. Uh, continuity, sleep periods should be seamless without fragmentation, meaning you're not waking up or you know, feeling restless throughout the night and depth, the sleep should be deep enough to be restorative. So how do you know if you're getting those things? Well, for me, way back um, when I started taking an interest in improving my health, I decided that I wanted to use biofeedback. And this is the process of gaining, gaining a greater awareness of many physiological functions of one's own body. Uh, you can do this commercially by using electronics or other instruments and with a goal of being able to manipulate the body system at will. It's non-invasive, non-drug treatment, which teaches you to control bodily processes that are usually involuntary, such as muscle tension, blood pressure, and heart rate. So I have an iWatch, and one of the things I did was download um, the sleep app watch, and I started to monitor uh, my sleep behavior through the night, and I started to correlate that with how I was feeling. Um, the app also asks questions as soon as you wake up, you know, how well rested do you feel? And then later in the day, it asks you how you're feeling. Um, I can tell you that now I've been doing this for so many years that if I wake up feeling a certain way, I know almost exactly how my rhythm is going to look. Um, but this, you know, correlates about the amount of time of rest I was getting, um, which is also how much of it is restful sleep and then looking at my heart rate. And that was really what I was paying most attention to initially was the heart rate itself. So this is just an example of a night where I didn't have good rest. I may have gotten eight hours, but if you notice, if you look at the heart rate in this graph, it is showing that I'm up to uh, almost a hundred beats per minute while I'm sleeping and it never dropped down below 74. Here is a more restful night in comparison. So I'm still getting eight and a half hours of sleep, but I got to bed earlier. I probably didn't have a glass of wine or maybe I didn't eat late um, or maybe I limited my caffeine that day, but I had a 24% dip in my heart rate and my heart rate went down to just below 60 and was very stable over the night. And I did not have as much movement. Um, I saw I was getting more restful sleep. So just imagine what this is doing, you know, for your body, for your brain, for your heart, you know, from the time we are conceived and our heart starts beating 
that needs to continue for a lifetime. And it's during these restful periods at night that we're allowing our body, just like when we're plugging in our charger to our cell phone, this is what you need to kind of think of, like how are we getting that rest, restorative rest? So what are some of the things that I began to incorporate? Um, and these are things that you don't necessarily have to do all of them. And you can start off with one um, and then maybe build upon and, and adding other habits um, into your sleep hygiene routine. Um, I just wanna also throw out that if you've never uh, read the book, Atomic Habits by James Clear, I highly recommend that. So write that down, Atomic Habits. Um, he teaches you how to incorporate new habits that are stackable, meaning that you can start with one and, and with small changes, you can reach big goals. So things that I would recommend is limit alcohol and caffeine, uh, pay attention to how those things make you feel and how your sleep is. Begin to incorporate daily exercise, you know, whether it's 20, 30 minutes a day, brisk walk, weight training, um, or getting out and enjoying an activity that you, uh, you know, enjoy doing that raises your heart rate, but this is going to help you sleep better at night. Um, I enjoy uh, doing an Epsom salt bath. This is a, a magnesium bath. I don't do this every night, but certainly when you're thinking about maybe facing a, a busy week ahead to start your week off with a great uh, soak in the tub. Um, I do drink herbal tea every night. It's become a part of my bedtime routine. Um, I do self-care, make that time to wash your face and brush your teeth, uh, find comfortable sleepwear. Uh, and bedding. Make sure your bedroom temperature is not too hot, not too cold. Um, I keep a pillow lavender spray um, on my nightstand, and I use it every night. Uh, my husband often has to turn away because I often spray him in the face by accident. And um, I try to stretch before I get into the bed because, you know, we get, especially as we get older, we get a little bit stiff, and I think it helps us just sleep better to loosen up before we get in bed. Um, and then meditating, slow breathing, um, you know, learning how to take in nice deep breaths and just relax and, and oxygenate our body and our mind uh, before we fall asleep. And then I have also found that I do have a busy household, especially when my college age students are home, children are home, not my students, and they're in and out of the house, or I have pets that might be coming in out of the bedroom or jumping on my bed, um, I find that if I wear earplugs, I can block out all of that noise or my husband's snoring. And um, also just staying off my screen uh, before I go to bed um, and just blocking out light. I do wear an eye mask and I travel with one. So it's nice wherever I'm at, if the, the lighting is too bright, um, then I can be able to block all of that out. So those are some of the things that I have incorporated to improve my sleep, the biofeedback, I look at it every day, and it just is a good reminder of what's working in my life and what's not. Um, I want you to think of this as a time to take care of yourself and that your sleep is just as important as everything else that we're doing. Um, and this can prevent long-term chronic illnesses and help you be a better student. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chronister. That was excellent. A great way to start um, with great strategies. And uh, we may be returning back to talking about some of those things um, later. Um, but we'll go ahead and um, take that good night of sleep that we have and move it then into the next thing, which is we should be eating well or you know, trying to think of ways that we can incorporate nutrition into our day. And so we'll move uh, now a little to the topic of um, Rebecca and, and how does a healthy diet and building in some healthy nutrition habits contribute to resiliency? Thank you. I like how you pointed out, Dr. Cronister, about eating too late does not help with your sleep. I was going to mention that as well. Um, I could, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I could bore you with caloric recommendations for each and every person. But honestly, when it comes down to it, the truth is it comes down to what you're eating that is most important when it comes to your diet. Um, when you're talking about resiliency, this means we're looking at the ability to bounce back from difficult situations that life is throwing at us. And food really does play a big part in academic resiliency. So I broke it down into two situations for you to think about. 
first situation is it's the end of the semester, you're cramming for finals, you're living off a diet of either coffee or soda or Red Bull, you're eating pizza, fried food, chicken wings, chips, snacks, whatever you can get your hands on because it's fast and it's easy. Um, and you do this for days or as for long as you're cramming for your exams. After you take your finals, what happens? You crash. Your body literally crashes because you're trying to recover from all of the excess salt, the excess sugar, the excess calories that you've just ingested over this period of time. So let's look at it in a different way. Again, you're at the end of the semester and you're studying for finals, but instead you've taken time in advance to prepare healthy, delicious snacks like fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts, things that are not processed. Um, you have your meals prepared in advance and ready to go so you're not running at the last minute to get something to eat. And they are well-balanced proteins, carbohydrates, very little processed ingredients. You have, or once your finals are over, you're gonna feel exhausted, of course, because finals wipe you out, but you are not gonna crash like you would if you're eating all of this other types of foods that are not so good for you. Cutting back on those processed foods are gonna help to decrease some of that inflammation in your body that help that makes you feel so slow after you've eaten, let's say a bag of Fritos instead of having a nice apple or an orange. So my story is my last year of the master's program, which is quite intense. You're also preparing for boards so that you can be certified and practice for what you've been studying for years. It's at this time that I really got myself together and focused on what I was eating, how much I was eating. And I was actually able to lose about 100 pounds in a year's time um, and successfully completed the MSM program, passed my boards, started a new job. And like it felt like, yes, it was a huge feat, but it didn't completely destroy me. It was doable because I had good nutrition, I had good sleep, I was exercising, and it helped me mentally to be stable. So some of my tips for you guys, most important, make sure you're drinking water, at least 64 ounces a day. I'd love to say that soda and coffee count. I, I don't believe they do. <laughs> you really, Plain water is the best. Um, I also really suggest instead of eating like three large meals, break it down into smaller portions. Have snacks prepared and ready to go. Um, what saved me the most was I would pick my slowest day of the week, the one where I had time to do things. I would portion out and prepare what I needed for the week so that when I got into those times where I was rushing around and I just didn't have time to prepare food, I didn't have to worry about it. It was already there and ready to go. So I can make the right choices for myself. Um, you know, eating a healthy diet is just one part of academic resiliency, but it really is crucial to help you maintain your energy levels to make sure you're not crashing from eating too much sugar and so on. That's what I have. <laughs> That's fantastic, Rebecca. And I, you're reminding me, I'm not a very good water drinker myself. So I'm also thinking like it helps to flavor it. So if I can't get, if caffeine doesn't contribute, like the coffee doesn't contribute, then if I have to do the water, I try to find ways to flavor it. That seems to help make it more palatable. <laughs> but thank you. Those are great tips that we can all use. So um, you mentioned about the importance of sleep and diet, and then also that exercise piece. So that's a great segue then into Emily's um, idea here with, uh, you know, keeping ourselves physically healthy and the importance of activity and exercise. So Emily, I'll turn it over to you. And what can you tell us about, you know, physical activity and, and staying active and how that contributes to resiliency? Thank you. I'm just going to share this screen here. All right, so what's on the screen is the recommendations from the CDC. Um, so when you exercise, you have immediate health benefits, but also long-term benefits. 
Um, so some of the immediate things that you get from exercise, you know, you're going to have less anxiety, um, reduces blood pressure, improves your sleep quality. And these are all from those endorphins that are released when you exercise, which are kind of your happy hormones. They make you feel, you know, that like feeling of euphoria. Um, so that's going to be all your immediate effects that you're going to feel. Um, then some of the longer term effects that you're going to have um, is actually improved brain health. Um, it kind of reduces the risk of dementia and depression. You're going to have lower risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes. It even lowers the risk of eight different cancers, including bladder, breast, colon, endometrium, esophagus, kidney, lung, and stomach cancers. Reduces the risk of weight gain, improves your bone health, and increases balance and coordination. So the CDC actually recommends about 150 minutes, which equates to two and a half hours up to 300 minutes, which is five hours a week of moderate intensity exercise. So that's something kind of like brisk walking. Um, or an hour and 15 minutes, which is 75 minutes to 150 minutes, which is two and a half hours a week of vigorous intensity aerobic exercise. That's kind of that harder ex exercise, such as jogging, running, that's really getting your heart rate up. Um, you can also do kind of a combination of these moderate and vigorous exercises, um, but these activities should kind of be spread out throughout the week. And then there's also additional health benefits gained by um, some muscle strengthening activities um, that works all your major muscle groups two or more days a week, which can provide the additional health benefits. So some, some ways to get started. Um, look for ways throughout the day to kind of reduce your time sitting, uh, increase that time moving throughout the day, starting maybe a tradition, a routine of, you know, walking before dinner, after dinner, um, setting aside specific times throughout the week for physical activity and kind of incorporate that into your weekly routine. Um, start with activities that you enjoy or locations that you enjoy. If you prefer being out in the morning or maybe the evening, you know, start with those times that you enjoy most. Um, you can try activities with friends, with family, somebody that will provide you that motivation and encouragement to keep doing it. Um, and always start slowly and work your way up to, you know, more time in a, in a day or the more time in a week. Um, start with those activities such as walking, um, maybe before you start running, and then work your way up to doing those harder activities. You can also use, there's a whole bunch of free apps out there um, on your phone for activities. Um, you can even, if you want to join apps, I know I have, I use the Peloton app, which is um, like $10 a month, but it offers all sorts of activities um, ranging from 10 minutes to an hour classes. So that's what the CDC at least recommends for exercise for adults. Um, and then with how that kind of works into resilience, there's there was actually a study performed in the UK during COVID that actually looked at exercise and resilience. And they actually found the link that the more people exercise, the higher they had um, resilience. And I kind of saw this myself, um, this, especially this past semester, um, I started trying to run a little bit more to train myself for this 10K that I was going to do um, with some of my coworkers. So I was running several miles a day, multiple times a day, and I would take my dog with me. She'd just kind of be my encouragement. You know, I could get out and enjoy the weather and exercise, and so could my dog. Um, so that was kind of my motivation, you know, and I felt real good. I was eating even a little healthier then too, because I didn't want to go run so many miles and then come back and eat fried food and feel like crap. <laughs> um, so, and then I noticed I was sleeping better as well. So I was exercising, I was eating better, I was sleeping better, I felt better. I seemed like I had more energy, I was getting stuff done. Um, especially at the end of the semester, you know, with this DNP project, I had 
I had um, revisions that were due. I had to get ready for IRB, all this stuff. Um, and so I, I ran the 10K and after the 10K, I kind of fell off the boat a little bit, you know, wasn't running as frequently. And then, you know, kind of got cold and so I wasn't going to go outside <laughs> and run in the cold. And then, uh, then you kind of noticed to start feeling a little bit more sluggish. I wasn't quite as motivated. You know, my, I lose patience easily. I get real irritable. Um, then the one day I open up my computer and it's like blank. I don't have any of my files here. I'm thinking I lost all my DNP stuff and I just kind of like break down. <laughs> and I feel like, well, if I would have kept up my exercise routine, I may not have responded quite the way I did when that happened. Um, and now I'm trying to get back into this more healthy routine of physical activity, eating healthier. You know, we're in a new semester now. I have to <laughs> do at least what I can during this last semester to get all this work done for graduation. And so I'm trying to do what I can to help out. So with this nicer weather, you know, I, I started running outside again and I can notice that I'm feeling better already. Um, and it, it's harder because I didn't do it for a while, but, you know, start off doing a little bit at a time and um, you notice, you notice definitely right away that, you know, all around your, the way your body feels, your mood um, really does improve when you can at least get a little bit of extra physical activity. So that's what I have. Thank you, Emily. And I, I feel like we might, I, at least I can speak for myself. I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, it, it's really hard to get started and it feels so good once you're doing it. And then you do end up with, you know, getting busy or, you know, having a challenge of some sorts. And then you maybe don't prioritize doing those healthy behaviors as much. And then you do start to feel the effects of that. And it can be really hard to get started again. Um, but I think it's important too. Some we've talked about taking like small steps or starting smaller or, you know, doing like, um, you know, shorter durations of things. And I think that's probably the key here is that none of these have to be done as an extreme. Um, just make a small goal and then work towards that for each of these behaviors. And, and that sometimes makes it a little easier to do, especially as you're trying to accomplish this when you're moving through hard times. So um, goodness, I mean, you have a, you had a great example there and I hope everything has worked out with the computer um, since you've come up with that, you know, since you've had that story and that experience. Um, but thank you for sharing. Um, I think we all can relate to that message to some degree. So then our final um, speaker here, our final panelist, and certainly again, not, last but not least, um, is going to be Dr. Federhoff. And again, we were somewhat um, deliberate in the planning of how to talk about these behaviors because she is going to be talking about, um, you know, the importance of stress management, uh, having effective coping strategies. Um, and really, I think what you're going to hear in her message is that um, in order to do all this effectively, it really is a combination of figuring out what behaviors are we doing that are good and what are those that are maybe not so good and um you know based on what we've heard from today you know we've talked a lot about positive behaviors that we should be doing and these can certainly feed into having being able to manage tough times but we also sometimes maybe develop ineffective ways to cope um and so she's going to talk a little bit more about all this stress management coping skills and kind of bring us all together here um so kelly i'll i'll hand it over to you and you can tell us more about how stress management and coping Coping really affects our resiliency. Okay, so the question I was asked to answer is how does effective stress management and coping skills contribute to academic resiliency? So to answer this question, I'm first going to talk about how stress reduces academic performance. So constant stress does not allow for consolidation of memories. Um, when a person experiences chronic stress, the brain is constantly bathed in stress hormones. Um, it can damage your hippocampus, which is the part of your brain that's responsible for memory, um, and that inhibits it to form new memories. Um, and when a person experiences stress, the brain also inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is what's involved with kind of like your rational thinking. Um, and it allows your fight, flight, and freeze response to kick in. Um, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for retrieving memories, which is why we draw blanks during a stressful test. 
So when you're taking a test, if your brain is hyperactive and in a stress state, your brain cannot access the information or think logically. Um, so what can we do to avoid chronic stress and panic during exams? Um, first, we should assess what coping skills we are currently using. Um, I, I don't think until I went into my career as like a psychiatric nurse practitioner that I even really knew what coping skills were or what my coping skills were and how big of a difference that they make once you're able to like identify them and use positive things. Um, so are the coping skills you're currently using, are they good or bad? So good coping skills, you know, a lot of the things we talked about today, um, exercise, um, self-care, meditation, um, setting aside a time for things that you enjoy, journaling, um, examples of bad coping skills, drinking to relieve stress, um, eating excessively, eating bad foods like Rebecca talked about, um, or, you know, using shopping as a coping skill. Um, so of all the things that we already discussed, these are all important parts of self-care. Um, and Dr. Conister, she talked about, you know, sleep and how important sleep is. Um, she talked about long-term effects, um, but just some of the short-term consequences. So, you know, I think we're all guilty sometimes of, you know, cramming before tests and not getting good sleep before a test. Um, but short-term consequences of poor sleep include increased stress, somatic pain, emotional distress, cognitive memory and performance deficits. So when we're really staying up all night cramming for tests, that's not doing us any favors. Um, so to make this a little bit personal, um, I'm gonna talk about um, my bad habits when I was an undergraduate nursing student. I will say this is, you know, before I had any mental health training or psychiatric training, all of the things that my co-panelists were talking about all the bad things were me when I was an undergraduate nursing student. You know, I was young. I thought I could cram before a test. I remember spending like 12 hours in the library the day before a test, not getting good sleep, waking up. I even actually had a panic attack in an exam one time. Um, and I was probably due to lack of sleep and excessive caffeine um, because I wasn't taking care of myself. And I thought, you know, I'm invincible, I'm young. I don't need these things, right? Um, I also like didn't prioritize my education as much as I had. I mean, I guess it's a little bit easier when you're an undergrad and you're not also working. Um, for me, when I did my master's and my doctorate, I was working full time as a nurse, like many of my co-panelists. So I didn't really have much time for partying. Um, and in, as an undergrad, though, I think it's pretty easy to fall into those, you know, doing having less responsibility and doing more things that we enjoy and not prioritizing, you know, our health um, or sometimes our studies, unfortunately, or thinking that, you know, last minute we can pull these things together. So my DNP, I mean, my master's program, I'll say, you know, I started to get a lot of psychiatric education. I started to learn a lot about mental health. I think my habits improved. They were nothing like they were when I was a DNP student. Um, you can ask a lot of the people in my cohort, I think I was, I think it annoyed them a little bit how much like habits and structure I made for myself, um, like bringing in exercise, I would go to the gym every morning, like even though I was working full time, and I was a doctorate student, I went every morning. And my husband actually could tell if I didn't go to the gym that morning, because I my mood was like crappy, I was irritable. Um, in my DNP program, I would set, like I had my full schedule made out. I would set alarms when I had assignments due so I wouldn't forget. I learned how to say no to my friends when I had something coming up and, you know, not just the night before, maybe the weekend before, like I had something important due the next weekend. I wasn't cramming that weekend to do it. So part of, you know, reducing your stress is also setting healthy boundaries for yourself. Um, and learning to use your healthy coping skills so your overall stress is reduced. Um, so I can't stress the importance of good habits enough um, in just improving your overall stress management. Um, so, and stress management is not 
is important, not just for academic resilience, but also dealing for everyday stress. Life is full of obstacles and having an effective stress management will help you stay committed to all other health behaviors and build your resilience. Um, we can build resilience by learning how to cope positively with negative events and emotions. Um, overall, stress management will reduce episodes of panic, stress, and improve your ability to problem solve. That's great. What a great take home message and a, a, a great way just to kind of wrap all of what we've talked about today together. Um, and so uh, we have finished this part of going through the different health behaviors. Um, and so this is a great opportunity now to kind of think about, you know, what you've learned um, and open it up to any questions or um, comments that anybody has that they would like to ask any of our panelists or a few of our panelists. I'm kind of curious with those that are on the um, webinar, if these are strategies that you have used, currently use, or if you feel that you maybe learned something new today that you can start to incorporate into your routines. Uh, Dr. Moyer, I see that we have a question um, from a student regarding her dorm roommate or his dorm roommate um, and uh, the snoring and if I have any recommendations um, to help with the roommate situation since you can't change roommates. Um, so first thing I would do is maybe if they weren't on this uh, webinar today, share the information that um, you did learn. Um, and maybe there's some things that uh, both of you can incorporate and look at and evaluate your living situation so that you both are getting a better night's rest. Um, and if you haven't invested in some good earplugs, I'd start there too. Um, you can also use some background noise, like um, there's brown noise, white noise, black noise, um, so that you can sort of drown out some of the snoring and make it a part of more of a, a harmony sound. <laughs> um, but I would work at it together and maybe just bring up the conversation by saying, hey, guess what I listened to today? Um, and I want to share some of it versus just, hey, your snoring's really bugging me. Um, they might be more uh, open to conversation. Great, thank you. I'm not, um, oh, we have another one. Uh, we have busy as students. In most cases, sleep is a luxury. I tend to work school stuff in at night. How do I change this habit? Um, okay, well, I'll speak to that again. So first of all, get the book Atomic Habits uh, by James Clear. And I would take a step back and really look at your entire schedule, like some of the other panelists said, and and take inventory of what, what does your 24 seven routine look like? You know, what does your entire day map it out and see if you can rearrange some of the things. Um, and like uh, Dr. Federoff said too, is to ask yourself, are you cramming? Could you plan and organize a little bit better uh, so that you can make and carve out that time for better rest? That's great. I would also, um, you know, we talked a lot about, um, I, some of you have mentioned the ways that you keep motivated. And I think that's also an important piece to all of this is we talked about how hard it can be to get started with all of this. And I'm just wondering too, you know, do any of you have some advice or suggestions on how do you keep, um, you know, staying motivated or inspired to keep up with some of what you have talked about today? Oh, I can speak on that. Um, I think that's really important for people to sit down and think about what is your why? What is your why for doing what you're doing? Um, and it takes you pulling away, sitting aside, maybe doing some meditation and kind of thinking about what are the most important things to you? Why are you in college? Why are you going for this degree? What, what is it that is driving you? And once you have defined that and focused in on what it is, I suggest writing it down and posting it somewhere where you can see it every single day, as much as you need to help keep you driven and motivated. I, I will also add, I think it's um, important to surround yourself with people who have some of the same goals. Um, and so if you're with people who want to achieve some of the same things that you do, and you can work at some of this together, like working out, um, maybe looking at your nutrition, cooking a meal together, uh, or eating in the dining hall and, and picking things that are healthy. 
um, getting into a hobby that you enjoy, um, and just building upon those things that may then lead to good sleep as well. Perfect. And I was also, I think a good follow-up to some of what you're, you are all saying as well, is just that connection piece. And um, I, I think this came out in some of some of you who talked about some of these behaviors, but I'm wondering too, like how important it, is it to stay connected to people or resources? Um, and how do you see that playing a part in being resilient? Because can you do this alone or is it important to have those support systems and who do you draw on to, to provide that support? Anybody else want to answer that? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it's, again, to ask yourself, um, you know, your own individual goals. So for example, when I mentioned biofeedback, you know, finding out what's working for you individually, but then also like some of the panelists said, learning to say no to other things and yes to some. So finding those people that are in your corner that do support you, um, that do want to see you achieve um, and then holding each other accountable, you know, checking in with each other, even if it's not face to face, but being able to, to connect and even some of the, the apps that are like the Peloton or the fitness run, you can share each other's stats and cheer each other on. And I think that's really important as well. I don't know if anybody else has something to add. I'm thinking, Emily, you talked about your dog. So I'm even thinking like our support, we, we might think of our support systems as being people, but I think our pets um, as well, you know, they are very encouraging. Like they're there, they're expecting us to, to, to be taking them out and they can be very motivating as well. So I don't know if anybody else has anything else they want to add to that idea of support and, and resources. So I, I think I, sh I think we should add that, you know, not everyone will have a support person. Um, and if you don't have someone like that, another option is to make a list of your goals, like just writing down what your goal is and being able to check those boxes off. That in itself gives you a positive reward um, or even creating positive rewards for yourself. Um, you know, if I finish my paper, you know, three days before the deadline, I'm going to buy myself a nice dinner. You know, we don't need somebody all the time to hold us accountable because not all of us do have somebody to do that, but you can, you know, create goals for yourself and create re rewards for yourself when you do meet um, your goals. Yeah, it's a great point, Kelly. And, and I think that also is a great way to identify too, especially to the students on campus. Um, you know, you may not have specific support individuals, um, but there's certainly resources that are available too. So um, looking at, you know, the Center for Health Education and Promotion, it might be a great place to go for more information on health behaviors and health promotion ideas. But also just um, there's tutoring services, counseling services, um, you know, health services. So there's other resources too that are available on campus to help, uh, you know, build different aspects um, in your resilience um, model that you're trying to have, um, especially depending on what might be a challenge for you or, you know, depending on the need that you have. So I think it's great that I, we identified that it's important to have that support, whether it comes, you know, from your, from within, uh, from your friends and family, um, but also the university has those support services too. So that's great. Um, I did see that we got another question here um, into the chat, and I think we still have time for questions. So um, it does say, how does the food we eat contribute to the kind of resilience that we might have? Um, I think this is coming from the idea that maybe there's not uh, the, you know, some of the options here on campus may be more limited. And so I think just looking at, you know, how, I guess, you know, do we kind of how do we kind of expand what we are able to have to, to, to do the healthy things that we need to do? I guess the best thing you can do is, you know, obviously look at your options and see what you have available. Um, we all know fast foods taste delicious. I'm assuming my panelists can agree with me there. There's nothing better than some French fries um, or a hamburger. But what ends up happening is as you're digesting this food, your body, while it may taste good, it the easiest way for me to put this is it almost reacts as if it's like a virus and your body kind of like, I don't want to say attacks, but it gets inflamed and unhappy and it doesn't digest well. So what ends up happening is you feel tired and exhausted. Whereas if you eat like 
maybe a salad with some fresh protein on it, you're going to have that energy because your body is able to easily break it down. Um, and that will help with your resilience and your ability to bounce back from difficult situations. When you're in the, the dining area, my suggestion is scope out what all is around, find your healthiest option and adjust it as you need. Take little pieces from here and there and build yourself something amazing. Um, that's often what I ended up doing when I was forced to choose, um, like even going out to a restaurant, you have to pick and choose what you want to eat so say they have a salad but it's in a fried taco shell and it's topped with guacamole and dressing and all of this get your dressings put on the side tell them to hold the taco shell like try to make it a healthier option you'll feel better for it that's great advice margaret was there um any other questions that came in for our panelists or anything else um that we can comment on no, I don't have anything to add, nor did I get any other question. I just want to say thank you so much. That was powerful. And I want to thank the students that logged in, everyone that just found time to be here this afternoon. I think we've all taken something from what our panelists had to share with us. And Susan, we love to partner with you about this sessions they are always very very powerful i thank the school of nursing for producing such powerful graduates mm -hmm. uh, you know people that are such professionals wherever they are working helping people in hospitals and in other forums and i just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share with us this is recorded for students that were not able to come. We got a lot of emails from students asking uh, about you know, the recording. And so this is going to be available. All these academic resilience sessions are recorded and they are posted in the Department of Academic Advisement and Student Development website. On behalf of my colleague, Dr. Han Godino, who was not able to be here, again, thank you so much for being here and we greatly appreciate have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.